So today I would like to tell you a story about the oil sands. This resource has been described as being the Golden Goose of Alberta or the Jewel of the North, even um, dirty oil, ethical oil, green oil, snake oil. Each of these terms is overflowing with meaning and value embedded in technical, political, environmental, cultural rationalities. This is also a story of adventurism, innovation, entrepreneurialism. This is a story shared by many Albertans. My own grandparents, great-grandparents, sorry, immigrated here from Norway 100 years ago, trying to find a new homestead, a place for their family. They traveled north, they traveled south, hauling around 11 children. My great-grandmother was not a happy woman at this time, you can imagine, having to uproot her family. They found a house near Gerard. The house leaked so bad, they had to put a tent over top of the roof. Then they moved to Viking. You know, as Norwegians, they found it strangely attractive. Um, a grass fire swept through and burnt everything, so they had to move into a small little house behind the beer parlor. That's where my grandfather was born. Uh, my great-grandmother was not happy about that either. But they uh, found their, their homestead. They built a big house. They had more children, even more, um, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and they found their golden goose. They found their golden goose. So if we were to look at the story of the oil sands, how would companies be characterized? Would they be characterized as Jack, the adventurer who brings prosperity back to the land? Or would they be characterized as the evil giant? And I suggest to you all here today that the end of the story has yet to be written. We can look at the past and how we've talked about it in the past, but the end of the story has yet to be told. And we can tell the story. It's ours to tell. So first I'd like to talk with you about how the oil sands has been written um, about through time. So what I did is I searched on LexisNexis, which is a large online database, for the terms oil sands and tar sands in Alberta. And it gave me over 12,000 newspaper articles. So this diagram shows how the attention, the number of newspaper articles per year, has increased exponentially through time. And the number of newspaper articles is significantly correlated with the price, the nominal price of oil, with an R squared of 0.83. So the price of oil goes up, attention goes up. Almost a, a perfect relationship. So how have people been talking, how have they been talking about it through time? So what I did is I then looked at the labels. How are labeling this, this resource? Is it oil sands or is it tar sands? So this graph shows the relative um, prevalence of those terms by year through time. And you can see up until 1975, it was exclusively tar sands. Tar is something you put on your, your roads or your roof, not something of value. In 1975, St. Crude's partners received tax concessions uh, and other uh, compensation from various governments. And suddenly, it became a resource of value, something that was increasingly becoming oil. So up until um, tar sands was still the predominant label in 1995, we see this back and forth. Um, oil sands, also known as tar sands, uh, as we try to explain to outsiders what is this resource and how may we use it. Then, um, with the uh, Asian financial crisis and the Iraqi war, the price goes through the roof and it becomes almost exclusively oil sands. Oil is something you put in your tank something of value. But then in 2008, we have the perfect storm of high oil prices, high media attention, and a really, really visible event, the 1,600 duck deaths on St. Crude's tailings ponds. And what this event did, more than anything, was provide the perfect visual metaphor for the defilement of water and the suffocation of nature. Those images are are burned into our brains. And then suddenly this resource again became tar sands, but with newly pejorative meaning. Tar is something that's dirty, sticky death. So it was no longer just merely descriptive, you know, what is this resource? Do we put it in our tank or on our roads? It, was, it had a, a much more negative connotations associated with it. So to understand the underlying meanings for these labels, um, I wondered what kind of words, how do we talk about this? And often when we are adding meaning to something, we look at oppositions. You cannot have male without female, uh, light without dark, good without evil. So in looking at how we um, look at these oppositions and how we combine them, we can see how are we making meaning and value associated with this resource. So I looked at the oppositions for the oil sands, um, past and future, uh, clean and dirty, um, nature, man, uh, 
efficient, inefficient, development, reclamation, to see how are we then talking about it? How are these words, how are we using them in combination? And then I use software, network software, to then say, how are we then combining words in vocabularies um, to talk about it? Because I had so much data, I had to figure out a, a really simple and visual way of, of making sense of all this data. So the network analysis allowed me to do this. So these are two diagrams, 1979 and, and 2011, um, network diagrams. So what I've done is the size of the word is scaled for the frequency of occurrence. The size of the link is scaled for the frequency of words co-occurring. Then um, more peripheral words are on the outside and more central words are in the middle. Um, if you look closely, you say, oh, this girl doesn't know how to spell. Um, well, I, mostly I do. And what I've done is the word roots uh, resource is also standing in for uh, resources, resourceful, resourcefulness. So it's, it's um, capturing all those different meanings. The other thing I've done is I've done um, a, a cluster analysis. to words, So words that are more likely to appear together are the same color. Okay, so, the, so that's kind of you know, what's happening in terms of the networks. What you can see here in, in 1979, it was a very... Um, monovocal discussion centered on oil, and we're all talking pretty much the same language, pretty much the same language. In 2011, it's, it's scattered, it's exploded, it's dense, it's lots of people, lots of conversations, lots of different words floating around, and you can see here that it's, it's become polarized, right? We've got the green side and we've got the, the red side. Um, and they're not using the same language anymore. They're using different words. The only word that's kind of in the middle is should. And both sides are trying to claim the ability to describe what should we be doing about this resource? What should we be doing? So it's really um, become uh, very, very polarized in terms of this discussion. Also, the words are much more evaluative and much more emotional. Like we've got words like better and good and um, uh, ethical. So these, a lot of these other words are starting to pop up, which is, which is very interesting. So the tenor of the debate has also changed. The conversation has also changed. And like I said, it's become very visual and very emotional. So I said to myself, um, with some co-authors, I said, wow, I mean, how do we study this? How this has become emotional and visual? So what we did is we looked at a series of advertisements by oil companies, environmental groups, and others to say, how do they then make meaning associated with this resource in a very a visual and emotional way? So I'm going to show you a bunch of these ads. First one is from BP, um, 2005. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this campaign beyond petroleum. And they argue like an engineer would. It's not surprising, right? They're a technical company. So they talk about what have we done, what are we doing, and how are we beyond petroleum? They give facts and figures, they give percentages, uh, and then a little bit of an amusing um, headline, amusing analogy. They say, you know, it's a low-carb diet for us, a low-carbon diet for our lifestyle, and are you cheating on your diet? So it's meant to be sort of a, sort of a play on words and invoke a sense of, of guilt with regards to the choices we're making in terms of our lifestyle. This next ad is from Greenpeace. Um, this is during the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. And um, they are basically saying, BP, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You're not beyond petroleum at all. You're soaking in it. You're absolutely soaking in it. And in, in the, the headline, the little text, you can't really read it. That's not the point. You're not supposed to read it. Tar sands, the other oil spill. But it's really dominated by this, this water bird that's, that's blotting out the logo of BP and that's dripping oil down on us, down on our heads. Um, and then it's the you know, headlining the... the the, the bureaucracy black is the new green. You're not, you're not beyond petroleum at all. You're soaking in it. So it's really meant to out British petroleum as, as a bunch of hypocrites. And emotional, it's emotional, it's very visual. It captures your attention, uh, and you, you get immediately what their, what their point is. You don't need to read the words. This next ad is from Ethical Oil Institute. So in response to this whole uh, dirty oil discussion, Ezra Levant wrote his book. He started the Ethical Oil Institute and ran a series of ads. And your lovely mayor was, was highlighted, I understand, against her will <laughs> in some of these ads too. Um, this one is talking about uh, Aboriginal peoples, and it really is um, meant to create um, a sense of, of we've, got, um, we've got ethical oil, right, where Aboriginal people are, are employed. She's beautiful, she's healthy, she's wanted, she's employed, she's got these beautiful teeth, she's looking up exultantly over her shoulder at God or her employer, right? Um, and then you've got conflict oil, right, where Aboriginal people are killed. It's a horrible picture. We're laying in the ditch. We're making eye contact with the corpse in the ditch. And the soldiers' backs are turned to us, threatening both us and the corpse. So it leads us, the viewer, to question, well, what choice are we making here? Are we getting our oil from the ethical oil country, 
we should hope so, where Aboriginal people are, are employed, or from the conflictual country where, where people are killed. So it really is uh, creating this sense of, of ethical versus conflictual. Who are we? Are we a, a, an us or a them in terms of, of what is this oil? Where, do we, where does it come from? How do we use it? Um, the next one I'd like to show you is from Tanker Free BC. They are against the Northern Gateway Pipeline and they're running a series of ads to tie into this debate about this oil. And you can see here, it's not about oil anymore. It's about energy, right? It's not about, it's sure ethics, but it's about broader questions of morality. And you can say to yourself, wow, I'm offended by this. I mean, there's no um, tailings that are ever going to flow through the, the Northern Gateway Pipeline. And there's no polar bears on the West Coast. And you'd be right. However, that's not the point of this ad. The point of this ad is what they're trying to do is tie into established visual metaphors. This, this, the duck, we're making eye contact with this duck in its final moments of death. We can barely believe that it's still alive, right? And the family, the mother and her babies, right? We know polar bear moms protect their babies. And here she is, you know, imploring us, you know, what kind of choices are we making? Is it ethical energy? Where are we getting our energy from? What choices do we have? Our real energy future, the real choice. So it's no longer about oil anymore. It's about energy, right? It's no longer about, about um, technical excellence, about BP. Um, Greenpeace has pushed them down. They're false environmental stewards. It's no longer about the environment anymore. Um, the ethical oil um, has pushed them down and say, look, it's all about human rights. It's about human rights. You can say, well, it's no longer about human rights anymore. It's about all life. So we've got the, the tanker free BC pushing down um, all the other previous arguments. So we see this real uh, a hierarchy of values um, that have, have now been engaged in this debate about what is this energy and how may we use it. So um, I like to talk, which is good for something like this. But uh, I, I like to share my research with my friends. And I've got friends who are hardcore, car-free environmentalists. I have friends who work, do policy work for government. I have friends who work for Exxon, for like a whole bunch of different oil companies, right? And uh, we talk about my stuff and they always ask me, um, which shocked me to begin with, they always ask me, they say, so, so whose side are you on? I'm like, oof. Um, the first time I heard this question, I was, I was shocked. I didn't know how to respond. And, and it's, because, it's because in characterizing this oil and considering this oil, you know, ethical, unethical, bad, good, right, and wrong, what we've done is we've created these false dichotomies. We false dichotomies. It's not about an us and a them. It's, it's about us. There's just us. So when they say, ask me, you know, whose side am I on? It's, it's the wrong question because there isn't sides, really. We're all on the same side. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. We all want to have a future um, like other speakers, that's better for our children than it is for us. I have kids. I want them to prosper. I want them to have the good life. Um, people say, well, what does the good life mean? Does it mean economics? Yes. Does it mean environment? Yes. Does it mean uh, culture and preservation of life? Yes. It means all of those things. So if you start to look at the language, um, how can we start to create a story, a vocabulary that includes all of these meanings? All of these meanings. So if you look at this, if we can reimagine this network in 2011, we use words like oil, world, like, now, people, right, good, must, public, water, nature, should, clean. These are all words that we all, um, we all ascribe to. We all, um, we all want. We all want. So uh, I have, a, at this point, a confession. confession. I've had a, an identity crisis in my research. And I'm an engineer by training. And as a researcher, looking at this um, in my training, we're taught, technical people, are taught to be distant from our subjects. We're taught to be analytically cool, to be separated from, to drain the emotion out of it because it's not about emotion. But you look at this and you say, but wait, emotion is powerful. Emotion is very, very, very powerful. You can have the moral outrage. What it does is it captures your attention. And, and critics... Uh, make the story stronger. But if you only focus on the negative, um, you can't move. You can't move beyond. You need to start focusing on the positive emotion. Words like hope and um, an imagined future and how we can create something better and best, this vision, this sense of shared vision of what the world can look like, how it can be better. So I suggest to you that um, 
you need the logic of the argument. Yes, we need to be technically excellent. You need to have people that you can trust, um, like, like the governor and others in positions of power who understand what good policy looks like and how to make good policy. But you also need to have emotion. And a lot of research in social movements um, and others have called emotion hot cognition. It's what, what fires us up, right? What fires us up. So who do we listen to? Someone we trust. What do we read? Something we care about. What do we do? Something in which we feel like we can make a difference. So emotion is not something to be feared. Emotion is something to be embraced. Embraced. So I, you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like a coming to Jesus talk for my technical folks to say, you know what, embrace the emotion, right? Embrace, recognize the power of emotion, recognize the power of the visual, and how you can then use this positively to create the sense of, of shared future. So what could this look like? This recent article in the Globe and Mail talks about a base mine lake reclamation as being having the potential to become uh, a recreational haven for boating, for fishing, fishing for, even for swimming. Uh, or it could remain toxic ponds, sullied with poisons, sullied with oil. So I suggest to you that we are at a point, the turning point, in terms of this story and how we choose collectively to write the end of this story. Do we want to remain um, stuck, mired in this negative emotion? Or rather, can we then think about positively how can we, can we create a, a shared vision for the future? This is my challenge to myself, why I went back to school, and this is my challenge to you, the audience. Because we do, we have the ability, the seeds for the story, we're like Jack and the Beanstalk, the seeds lie in our hands in terms of how we choose to sell the story. So together, let's create the shared vision. Thank you. <laughs>